Stay tuned to PBS 39 for an all new episode of Focus. The new masterpiece series, Victoria, on PBS gives viewers insight into the legendary Queen's reign and what it was like to live in 19th century England. As we focus on the arts, we see the Victorian era's influence on architecture, fashion, home decor, and even in the ways we celebrate modern holidays. Stay with us for this special look at the Victorian era in the modern day Lehigh Valley. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, Banking, Insurance, Investments, Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this Focus on the Arts. I'm Laura McHugh. A new masterpiece series on PBS showcases the life of one of England's longest reigning monarchs, Queen Victoria. The highly anticipated drama, called Victoria, takes place during the Queen's reign from 1837 to 1901. The time period commonly referred to as the Victorian era still influences modern day arts and culture. For more, here's Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo. The new masterpiece drama featuring actress Jenna Coleman as a young Queen Victoria got us thinking about what life was like during that time in the Lehigh Valley. To find out, I stepped into local museums and back in time to learn about the eclectic era and its influence on American architecture, furniture, fashion, and more. From now on, I wish to be called Victoria. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria's era of 1837 to 1901 was an incredible time of change, and not only in Great Britain, but also in the United States and also here in Bethlehem. It's amazing to think that some of these homes really were built in the Victorian era. They were. On our tour of the Victorian era throughout the modern day Lehigh Valley, we meet Charlene Donchez Mowers, president of Historic Bethlehem Museums and Sites. This part of Bethlehem was built during the reign of Queen Victoria and are very reminiscent of the various styles of that period. Queen Victoria's era was also the era of industrial revolution. It was a fascinating time and an incredible time of development in our community. Historic homes along this street in Bethlehem showcase the era's eclectic architectural styles. To me, this is high style Victorian. Take Heron Funeral Home, for example. Built in 1865, details of dental molding, pointed arched windows, and ornate patterns below the roofline accent the era's steamboat gothic style. This was a home for Weston Dodson, who made his money in the coal industry, and his family, and their servants. Original deeds detail the home's timeline through history. Can you imagine the long dresses and the parties oh, that were goodness. happening here? Wouldn't it be fun It'll to be go so back? Fun. Yes. <laughs> Just when I thought I couldn't get much closer to what remains of the Valley's Victorian era today, I meet Kathleen Coddington from the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society. This double parlor was extremely popular at the time that the house was built in the 1830s. A Civil War reenactor, Kathleen is the program development and coordinator for the Mike So Illich House Museum in Easton, built in 1833. The dress that I'm wearing today is um, a mid-Victorian um, design somewhere around 1859 to 1860s. <laughs> Walk a day in Kathleen's shoes and hoop skirt and relive life in Easton during the 19th century. My dining room table at home <laughs> doesn't look quite like this. No, there have been many changes in what's become popular in tableware. Take this vase, for instance. A vase a that vase. you put flowers in. Except that this is used for celery. Celery? Celery. <laughs> so you put the entire stalk in, leaves and all. So not only was it decorative, but it was edible okay. at the same time. 
and who could forget bone dishes and a pickle caster. Every table had a pickle caster on it. Pickles were one of the most popular condiments of the time. We transition from condiments to clothing with a wrapper worn for leisure, a plaid patterned day dress, and elegant evening wear. When Victoria comes to the throne in 1837, you see dresses going from more narrow, but with big, big sleeves to being far fuller in the skirts, and then the bodices being tighter and the sleeves being tighter. A silhouette that was based on circles at the time. So my hair is parted in the middle to kind of give my face a round look. The sleeves, the has a dropped shoulder line on the dress to make my shoulders look rounded, and then the very full skirt. To bring our journey full circle, we return to Bethlehem and the Kemmerer Museum of Decorative Arts for a glimpse at the mid-Victorian parlor, full of eclectic furniture and knickknacks. With the rise of the middle class, then people could buy things that didn't do anything. And for some families, things that served as forms of entertainment. Queen Victoria endorsed the stereopticon or stereoscope. These images are almost duplicates on each side, but they are slightly off. And so when someone peers through the viewfinder, they see a three-dimensional image. Lindsay Jancy is the museum's director of collections and programming and details the era's decorative arts, including floor-to-ceiling wallpaper in the museum's late Victorian bedroom. The late Victorian era was a time that marked a transition of the bedroom to a private space. As well as a perfume vial, a wash station, and a delicate brooch made with human hair. And I think it's important for both residents and visitors alike to understand how towns develop and evolve, how people live. To be able to track that here in the U.S. and show these pieces side by side creates a really unique experience. And experience captured within homes and heirlooms throughout the Lehigh Valley. And in a series fit for a queen. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzillo reporting. More about the Victorian era traditions, Brittany brought a special guest to the studio. That's right, I did, Laura. In that segment, you met Kathleen Coddington from the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society. Kathleen is a program development and coordinator at the Mikesell House Museum in Easton. Kathleen, thanks so much for joining us again. We couldn't possibly cover all of the Victorian era in that segment, but one of the other major influences that that era really had are on some of our holiday traditions. That's right, Brittany. Um, everything that we uh, practice today um, in regards to all of our huge holidays, such as Christmas, Valentine's Day, Halloween, even Easter, all began, those traditions really began to coalesce in the middle of the Victorian era. Uh, and starting with, I'm going to talk primarily about Valentine's Day since that's coming up um, in a very short amount of time, but there were three key elements that come together just at the right time. Okay. One of them has to do with chocolate. Brittany's uh, favorite. Yeah, that's my absolute <laughs> favorite. So thanks for bringing Everybody's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> of course, chocolate came um, from the New World, um, okay. and at the beginning, really was only used for making hot chocolate. Oh. Um, in the 16 huh. and 1700s, you could drink it as a drink, but there was very little else uh, that it was used for. Okay. It is until the se late 1700s that we begin to see some chocolate candies, things like nonpareils. But it's in the middle of the 1800s when chocolate molds were invented that we begin to see the candy um, industry explode. Wow. And there are many products that we have today that we that you go to the store and you buy and you don't realize how long that they have been in existence. Um, items like Lindor's chocolates and Ghirardelli chocolates and of course Cadbury. Everybody knows the Cadbury bunny. Oh, um, and the heart-shaped box came into being in 1861. Um, so just in time for um, Valentine's Day um, for gentlemen to be able to procure commercially produced chocolates. And of course, with the chocolates, you have to have the Valentine. And the, the, the second <laughs> thing that came into being just around the same time as the commercially produced chocolates were commercially produced cards, greeting cards. And Valentine's were particularly uh, um, popular, as were Christmas cards. And one of the things that led to their popularity, besides the fact that they're just beautiful items, is that there was a drop in postage at that time period. And when the postage came down to only a penny or two, suddenly people found out that they could send greetings to people all all over the country. And it also made it very simple for gentlemen because now they could go to the chocolatier or the confectionery mm -hmm. store and buy their <laughs> chocolate candies. Sounds familiar. They could then go to the card shop and pick up their Valentine card. 
Um, and then they only had one last key ingredient that they needed to, to do. And we'll talk about that yeah, in just a moment, yeah. but I want to mention these are the authentic these uh, are, Valentines yes. from the Victorian era. Yes, they are. These are part of the collection from the Valentines from the Northampton County Historical and Geological Society. In beautiful condition. Mm -hmm. They're just stunning. And would you only send them to the woman you love? Um, do Sometimes you would see them um, from close friends to each other. Uh, women friends okay. might send okay. them to their best friend, a husband to his wife. Um, a child to a parent, but mostly they were being sent by young couples okay. um, who were courting each other. So that last piece that they needed, they got their chocolates, they got their valentines, now they need the flowers. And that's my favorite. <laughs> and also one of mine. Um, the, the third key ingredient, of course, is the flowers, and it ties in with something that was very popular in the Victorian era, and that's something called the language of flowers. Okay. And the language of flowers has been around for a very long time. It's from the Middle Ages. Shakespeare talks about it in some of his plays. But it's in the 1800s when all of these various meanings for flowers are codified and put into books that it really gains popularity. And just about every woman, um, both in um, England and in the United States, owned her own language of flowers book. And they were beautifully done books that were filled with the names of all the flowers and the meanings or whatever sentiment you would like to send and what flower would equate to that particular sentiment. So let's talk about some of those meanings. We have a few fresh flowers here as well as some beautiful silk ones that you brought. Okay, well, of course, every flower, there's hundreds of them, every single flower we know um, and every herb um, has had some kind of a meaning attached to it. Roses in particular have always been something that have been um, connected with love and romance. Mm. Red roses usually stand for love or passion. Um, pink roses usually stand for something like maidenly blushes. White roses. Maidenly blushes? Maidenly blushes, <laughs> yes. Innocence and maidenly blushes. Oh. And white roses indicate from a gentleman to a lady that he's worthy of her love. Oh, interesting. Okay. So if he included one of those, he was letting her know that he was was worthy. I was surprised to learn about yellow roses, though. I always mm. uh, understood them to mean friendship. That is a more modern interpretation okay. of it. Um, over time, the original Victorian sentiment, some of them which could be um, a little on the harsh side, because not everything in the language of flowers, you know, was something that was kind or romantic. They did have some rather snarky meanings for things. So some of the books, if you compare early language of flower books to modern ones, you will see some changes. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those is Yellow Roses, which originally e either stood for jealousy or Ooh. a decrease of love. Oh, Ooh, that's interesting. Okay. So you did not want to get yellow flowers. So you did not flowers. want to get yellow flowers at that time. No, you did not. And generally what the whole language of flowers, what it was used for, um, was to translate the messages of what they called talking bouquets or tussy mussies. That's these. And these little bouquets we see here are examples of tussy mussies. Um, those go all the way back to the Middle Ages, actually. And the word tussy stands for the floral part, and the mussy was the wet moss that you wrapped around the stem oh. so that you could keep them fresh. And then you would take your tussy mussy when you received it, and of course, every lady would then go immediately to her language of flower book, <laughs> what is and that? she would look up all the flowers to find out what is the codified message that was being sent um, within that little bouquet. Now, if she received a dead flower, what did that mean? Well, dead flowers meant pretty much what we would think they meant today. It was letting somebody know that whatever the emotion was expressed with the rest of the flowers, that it was negating it. And in fact, you could negate the entire message by presenting it upside down. Oh. So that meant that anything that was positive in the message, you were doing the reverse. And so they, you know, they did that too. Or they just put one dead flower within the, the bouquet. So not everything was romantic, but mostly they, they were positive, romantic, or friendly greetings. For instance, this little one right here with all the chrysanthemums stands for cheerfulness under adversity. Um, the one that's next to it, which has a combination of morning glories and violets and a little pink rose there, is your innocent, faithful nature um, if elicits my affection in a confession of love. Now, uh, Kathleen, where can people learn more? Where can they learn more? Well, they, you can simply, the easiest way is to simply go online and Google language of flowers, and you will be amazed at the amount of information. Where can they see can. this display? 
Um, this display well, this is going to, we're actually for the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society, February 11th, mm -hmm. um, from 1 to 3, we are having a program called Chocolate and Romance, which is going to be held at the Mike's House, the Siegel Museum, and the Bachman Public House. All right, thank you, Kathleen, so much. Well, now that you know how to add some Victorian accents to your next holiday, let's see one place where you can find Victorian accents for your home. For that, we turn to Focus reporter Grover Silcox. Grover? Thank you, Laura. You can wander through the Gilded Age, the late 19th, early 20th centuries, by walking through a treasure trove of hand-carved bars, cabinets, mantles, ironwork, and stained glass at Ole Valley Architectural Antiques in Denver, Pennsylvania. These treasures of a bygone era reflect an age in which craftsmen created works of art in wood, glass, and iron for the affluent tastes of an emerging middle and upper class. The quality of this is definitely much more unique and detailed than the average bar. Joel Zettler's antiques are anything but average. It's the architectural antiques and large carved furniture, which I'm focusing on. Basically, highly carved, big, large, ornate pieces of furniture, kind of Gothic, kind of Victorian. Over a 45-year career, Joel has become a go-to guy for brokers, offering the promise of a rare find. I have a, a bar here, a local bar I'd like to sell. At Joel's Ole Valley Architectural Antique Shop in Berks County, Pennsylvania, customers wend their way through mountains of oak and mahogany bars, mantles, doors, cabinets, and more artifacts from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Most of the things I see I just decline because they're not good enough or rare enough or fancy enough. But he couldn't decline this fine oak bar in what was once an Allentown hotel built in 1900. We had to outbid everybody in the country to get that. I've never seen one ever that has six columns. Never. And uh, it's 36 foot long and the quality is just impeccable and it's very massive. Condition's perfect. Joel sells the back bars like this one for anywhere between forty and $150,000. With a front bar, they can go for as high as 200000 to learn more about the history and culture of these pieces, we invited Tom Keels, an author and historian, and his sidekick, Larry Argal, a former antiques dealer, to give us their impressions. Well, this is the famous Al Capone bar we've heard so much about. A few years ago, Al Capone's 28 Colt pistol sold for over $110,000. Now that had unquestionable provenance. It had a letter from Al Capone's sister-in-law stating, this is Al's gun, I saw him fire it, she didn't say at whom he fired it. Although we don't have that kind of documentation here, there may be somebody who really wants to have Al Capone's bar in his house. According to Larry, some of the finest antique bars were made by Brunswick, the company mostly known for making pool tables. And in 1878, they branched off into barbacks and bars, and their craftsmen were, were fantastic. The late 19th century, it was a heyday for wood carvers and, and carpenters and cabinet makers. This is very Austrian, mm -hmm. nouveau. Oh, yeah. See that? Wonderful carving, wonderful mm. design. Yeah, it is beautiful carving. Intricate carvings and scroll work on these antiques often reflect the lives of the people who owned them. We were looking at one mantle earlier that had an anchor right. over the top. Did it come out of the home of a nautical man, a former sailor, an admiral? Or was the anchor simply the Christian symbol for hope? The more elaborate your mantle was, especially in the late 19th century, the wealthier you were. Larry notes that no Victorian dining room was complete without a sideboard or buffet to display or place serving dishes. And, uh, imagine all the food spread out here. Really cool. I just love the detail on these pieces. There was no inch that was left undecorated. In the Victorian period, when you had massive dining room suites, you would have a hunt board, which is basically a sideboard where dishes would be displayed and also serving dishes would be placed. 
Ole's offers iron gates and fencing, which once primarily adorned the grand homes and properties of the Victorian era's well-to-do. Andre DeLuca, owner of Keystone Custom Ironworks, customizes these pieces for many of Joel's clients. Joel's stuff is made here in good old U.S. of A. Long time ago, the blacksmith, you know, hundreds of years ago, where they sat over their, their hammer and their Ford and they bent the metal and, you know, they put it all together. One architectural element that was present in many churches was beautiful ironwork. And these gates here look like they might have come from a church, perhaps the entry into a sanctuary or something like that. And ironwork was another important architectural element of the Gilded Age, and in this case, literally gilded. We're sort of coming into a new Gilded Age. People are building large houses, anywhere from five to 10,000 square feet, a 60-foot bar that would have been the showcase of a downtown hotel can now be the talking piece of your rec room or your man cave. Joel also supplies bars and other antiques for movie and television productions. His pieces have appeared in four Woody Allen films, The Big Wedding with Robert De Niro and Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis. I must have done 50 movies over the years supplying antiques. Joel's relentless search for the next big find, the exquisite barback or fireplace mantle, mirrors the growing demand for these one-of-a-kind architectural antiques. Oh, everybody wants something that's original. They don't want these reproduction pieces, and they'll, they'll fly up from all over the world. Joel's customers breathe new life into these rich pieces, which were made in an era when craftsmanship was raised to an art. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Grover, Brittany, and I are now joined by artist Virginia Abbott. Virginia is a resident artist at the Banana Factory Art Center in Bethlehem. She practices and teaches in many mediums, jewelry, sculpture, painting, and more, and today plans to teach us a little bit more about Victorian fashion. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Laura. So Hi, I Brittany. asked Virginia. Hi. Hi. Uh, does she do anything related to the Victorian era? And <laughs> she told me... Well, I don't, but I, I looked on the internet and found Victorian cuffs, which I thought were so pretty. They mm. look beautiful. And so mm. you made these? I Just for us? I did make them, started some, finished others. So um, yeah, they're so easy that just about anybody can do it. Well, let's prove it. <laughs> we'll they feature... I'm going to put that to the <laughs> test. <laughs> they feature Great. many accents that were common in Victorian fashion, right, Brittany? Lots yeah. of lace, mm -hmm. beadwork. Victoria um, loved jewelry. She loved jewelry. So we have some crystal up here. Okay. Yep, and uh, brooches were uh, very, oft, popular. very popular in that time period as well. So show us what we were doing today, Virginia. Well, you can take an ordinary, well, a, a lovely rhinestone, extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary piece, and add it to the glove. Ooh, so you don't yeah. have to necessarily wear it. Uh, <laughs> like you would normally wear exactly. it. Exactly, see? On, on your top. That, <laughs> <laughs> on the glove, Grover. Yeah, is that real? Real diamond? I no, I'm just kidding. Of course it is. <laughs> uh, as long as the pieces are similar, uh -huh. our mind kind of makes them think that they're the same, so uh, what I start with is cutting the hands off of a, uh, like a the, long glove. The prom gloves yeah. or oh, the okay. uh, bridesmaid gloves. Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, so the ones and that would come up to your elbow yeah. normally? Just cut, cut off the top, turn it under, maybe sew that. Okay. Uh, you can use decorative threads. You can hot glue it, you can just use regular glue, and then start to trim it out. So uh, we could add some braiding like this? Braiding, lacing. Lace. Mm -hmm. You could sew it. Absolutely. Like mm -hmm. And uh, you said we would, could pick buttons, brooches, <laughs> anything else we'd want to add? All, all of that. You can even see here, this lace, this is two different types of lace, but they look the same together. Um, remind me what you said again, like like and kind. Like and kind. Yes. So you want something that looks oh, okay. similar and that your mind will make that leap to help exactly. you. Interesting. It's kind of like. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And, and I see on these you've created some cameos. They were very popular during that era. Absolutely. These are from my cast paper sculpture. Beautiful. Uh, 
here's one that has, excuse my reach, that has the Cameo uh, sewn on, added buttons, and as you look at the back, that would be the back, so it already has that button. Yeah. And I cinched up this part. Shall we try these on, see what they feel like? I was like? just going to say that. That's and right. so are they meant to sure. be worn? How Which are end? they meant to be worn exactly? <laughs> okay, so over your wrist. So right over on your wrist. wrist. Yeah. Almost okay. like this. Exactly. These are reminding me of Madonna. Yeah, right? they do. They do. Um, was that what was that what drew you to them a little bit, maybe? <laughs> these are more like handcuffs, aren't they? <laughs> they are. As opposed hand to just he, cuffs. He went, there. <laughs> he went there. Yes. Well in my case they're they're like handcuffs. That's, they might be so a little I, small I'm for afraid you. I'll never get it off again. And, <laughs> I know. Do you want to switch? Well, yeah, hold we on now. Uh, oh, I think we're a little so jammed up. So certainly a lot of fun that you could add there to you your Victoria watching party. Something oh, sweet and little. And certainly you could do accents like this in a number of different ways and fashion. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Well, each fun. month we celebrate the artwork of a local student. Here's our latest PBS 39 Artist of the Month. Hi, I'm Justine Wallman and I'm the PBS 39 Artist of the Month. I like to draw because it relaxes you. It also gives you a chance to express yourself and your creativity. It lets you be who you are. Here's my drawing. It's called The Eyes of the Beholder. And the reason why I did this drawing was to show my art teacher what I could do because this was my first piece I did for an art class. My grandmother inspired me because she was my first art teacher. Unfortunately, she lost her drawing ability when she had a stroke, so I draw for her. The best part of being an artist is just being able to show people your work and it's just amazing to hear all the feedback. I also do martial arts and I'm a second degree black belt and it's one of my other passions. Don't ever let people put you down for what you do. You have to be creative and you have your own art style. I'm Justine Wallman and I am super excited to be the PBS 39 Artist of the Month. So I have to tell you, this show started out as a segment, and then quickly we found <laughs> out that the Victorian era is all around us if you know where to look. Right, Brent? Yeah, it really is. I mean, we traveled throughout the Lehigh Valley. It's so cool where you can find these Victorian era pieces. And of course, now I'm so excited to watch Victoria on TV and, and kind of see how her life unfolds after doing all this research. And of course, we focused mostly on Valentine's Day, yeah. but the Christmas holiday is very strongly inspired uh, by the Victorian era, even the fact that we use the color red and green uh, harkens back to that time period. It is, and so much on Victorian architecture. That's right, and uh, interesting to go to Ole Valley Architectural Antiques in uh, uh, Denver, PA, which is near Adamstown, which is like uh, Antique Row. Yeah, they call it <laughs> Antiques Capital USA. Uh-huh, yeah, and uh, his biggest challenge is just getting enough because there's such demand for the architectural antiques. Other antiques kind of declining, but not uh, but not the architectural ones, which were parts of buildings, big pieces of furniture, and 90% of the artifacts that he gets are from Pennsylvania. Wow. Well, that's just fascinating. Thank you both, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Until then, remember to focus on what matters. This program is recorded at the PPL Public Media Center at PBS 39 in Bethlehem.